So there you go. Question though. That's a great question about how long to lay down a Pinot Noir. Is there a limit? Generally, Pinot Noirs, because they have less tannin structure than Cabernet Sauvignon, tend to not age as well. And, and that's a broad stroke generalization. I've had Pinot Noirs that age beautifully and, and were awesome for both California and Burgundy. I've had wines from the 30s and 20s and the 90s that were delicious in France. Burgundies tend to age better. You almost have to age them because they have so much acidity and the style in which they are produced and what represents their soils and weather. Californians, in my opinion, we don't age as much. But I can tell you, at one of the World Pinot Noir dinners I was at, one of my, one of my hobbies is collecting old Pinot Noir from California. And I happen to have a few 1967 Pinot Noirs from Robert McNabby Winery in Oakville. And so I had a few of those. I pulled them out. They're usually salad dressing, right? At this point, <laughs> anyway. And they're pretty, it can be really rough, that old California Pinot Noir. I tasted it blind to a gentleman named Alan Meadows. Alan Meadows has a, a company called Berghound.com. And he's one of the foremost authorities, in my opinion, in the world on Burgundy. He's in particularly North America. He's an East American Californian. And his wife worked at Mondavi, and I worked at Mondavi, so it's one of these things. I went to his table. I poured that 1967. Pinot Noir from Oakville, Zen. He loved it, tasted them blind. He brought it to Christophe Lumier and a whole group of a round table of only French speaking winemakers from Burgundy. They all guessed late 80s Jebri Chambertin from France. And I, when I showed them the bottle, they lost it. They were like, they'd never seen that. So sometimes it can work, not most of the time. You know, I'd have to go to your house and look at your cellar and drink a lot of your wine to understand how you like wine. <laughs> I personally, for my cellar, what I like to taste, about five to six years past the vintage is when I'm enjoying those wines. That's a year and a half in barrel, that's three or four years in laying down. That's what I personally like to drink. Um, but, but I could go to your house, I could probably take a reverse analysis of your cellar and pretty, have a pretty good idea of what, how you like your wines. So, it's really personal preference. Hey Mike, Question, sir? I have some good advice. If you like the wine when it first comes out, drink it then, because you don't know what it's going to age to. And unless you have a lot of experience uh, with aging wines, any kind of wine, uh, just if you like it when it first comes out, drink it up. Exactly. And I had a perfect opportunity, yeah. If you're going to buy my wine, buy a case of it, and drink one a year for the next 12 years, right? Uh, so, I talked about New Zealand. I uh, got into I think Burgundy to New Zealand. So let me just hit on Cal I'll hit on Oregon. So Oregon, the Oregon wine business, you guys any questions at this point? Any other questions, you guys? Alright, so Oregon, you guys started uh, early kind of early 80s, oh, actually 60s with, with David Legg and uh, uh, Ponzi, Ponzi, Ponzi. And so these guys are kind of expats coming out of Davis who brought Pinot Noir up to Oregon. Dick, uh, Erath, Ponzi, those are the old school crowd. They took some interesting cuttings from, from uh, UC Davis, took them up to Oregon. They were just kind of guys who wanted to move out to the country and did a great job with it. It really didn't take off until really the mid 90s. In fact, an interesting uh, story for you guys, because uh, you all guys know about Byron Winery, right? And Ken Brown started that in 1984. And Robert Mondavi purchased that in 1989. And from that, that sale, he actually went to Oregon and bought land on a piece of land that today is called Willie Kinsey Winery. He owned that land personally. And so he was, his, his, his thing was, he was going to move up to Oregon and do a winery if it didn't work out with the Madoggies. But luckily for me in particular, and a lot of us here, it worked out. He sold that land to, to a brand and a winery called Willie Kinsey today. So it was really in that mid-90s to late 90s that Oregon really took off. They started that International Pinot Noir Conference in 89. 88, and it really got a lot of attention. When it comes to Burgundy and France, Oregon has a much more alignment to its style of wine. The style of wine in Oregon is a little bit lighter, it's a little more elegant, there's a lot of acidity there, and very often for people who are raised with Pinot Noir here on the Central Coast, it's kind of hard for them to sometimes get. Uh, I love that style, because I go home and I either drink a gin martini or a wine from somewhere way far away. This is different from what I do every day. So Oregon Pinot Noir is that, I love that style. It's very different, it's lighter, it's prettier, it's very elegant. But what appellation would you say produces the biggest fruit forward 
heaviest, not necessarily true to character, you know what I mean, but the most... In Oregon? No, in general, about Pinot Noir. I mean, if you wanted to get a Pinot Noir that mimics some of our fruit forward wines rather than being the more elegant, subtle style, what region would you look to? On Earth? Yes, on Earth. So the question was asked about what region on Earth would I recommend that has a wine that's bigger, heavier, more fruit, fruit forward? Or as a Pinot Noir. As a Pinot Noir, I would probably go to two, two areas. One, Santa Rita Hills. Santa Rita Hills, when that thing, obviously Richard Sanford started it back in the 70s, 72 I think it was, but when that stuff started coming out initially in the early 90s, we were all kind of going, what the hell is that? You know, and I came down, we, we, uh, I came down with Bruno and Chris and we and I did tech tours before Sea Smoke, we worked to hang out with my friends and was, we were tasting these wines and they themselves didn't, I, in my opinion, and I think some of them will honestly say, they didn't understand it at first, the tannins were so hard. It was so black, they're accused of putting straw in it. And so, but they, they understood that, they, they learned from that, they made these elegant, big, heavy fruit bombs, and, and now they will have elegance to them, and that's why Santa Rita Hills has that big boom, you know? Uh, another aspect, I mean, Russian, some parts of Russian River have that too. A lot of that, to me, is based on style and technique. Um, you look at Sonoma Coast, you know, those can be big, but that, I don't, again, I don't think that naturally comes from a place. I really think of the Santa, uh, Santa Rita Hills as the biggest kind of look to that. Some of the Edna Valley stuff, like in Domain Alfred, when I was in Domain Alfred, right. that wine on the cover of Spectator and all that love, that's a style of wine that people love that are big and fruity. And, and so when done correctly with techniques and certain vintage and hell of a lot of luck, you know, that, um, that's if, a theory too. If you were going to say somebody in Russian River that would make more of that style, you know, to get anybody come to mind. Oh yeah, a big heavy, you know, forward style like that would be uh, Martinelli. You know, those are extracted, big, thick wines. Uh, you know, uh, you know, William Sellium, you know, Costa Brown. You know, those are wines that are, are wonderful wines. They're beautiful wines. They're a new style of wine, which actually brings me to California. I'm trying to get through what I was told to do. That. All right. So that's right. So, uh, so Pinot Noir, you know, when you, when you move to California, for me, it's been an interesting study my whole life to understand and actually have the good fortune to get into it. Remember, I was drinking, when I first started, you know, I was drinking these 89s and 88 Pinot Noirs in California. And man, they really sucked. And they were not a wine that you were like, wow, these are delicious. And that goes across the board. There's only very few producers in the early years, and I'll call that the 80s, who understood Pinot Noir, and that's Mount Eden, Hansel. Uh, they, you know, uh, Stanford Benedict down here kind of understood that stuff. And so, but those were interesting, but they were not as interesting as what we're seeing today, you know? And so there's really, for me, it's an important, when we talk about California Pinot Noir, there's a real line in the sand. That line in the sand really goes back to Burgundy in the 20s and 30s. At the University of Dijon, there was a gentleman there